I would like to welcome everyone to the Roxborough Roundtables. My name is Jessica Putman and I am the student coordinator for the tables. Today our topic is historic costume and textile collections as a public resource. And our host today will be Marcella Martin. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, I am Marcella Martin. I am the curator of the textile and costume collection here at Philadelphia University. And I also am a university lecturer in the history of costume and textiles. So I will um, introduce our guests and then you all can just give a brief introduction. So if you want to start with you, Christina. I'm Christina Haglund. I'm the Levine Associate Curator of Costume and Textiles and Supervising Curator for the Study Room at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. I'm Suzanne Shapiro, I'm Archive Manager at BBH. Um, BBH is the company that owns Calvin Klein, Tommy Hilfiger, Aero, Van Heusen, a number of other American brands that I'll be speaking in that capacity. I'm Karen Connor. I am a graduate of Philadelphia University. I was a fashion industry management major and I graduated in 2015. Um, I have interned with Marcella at the Design Center here at Philly U. I've interned with Christina at the Philadelphia <laughs> Museum of Art, um, and I've also been Nicole Miller's uh, archive, archive intern as well. I'm Colleen Hill, and I'm the Associate Curator at the Museum at the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you all for being here, and thank you, everyone, for coming and for listening. Um, so I'm going to start with a question for Christina. Um, how does the PMA use its costume and textile collections to engage the public? Well, I think like many museums, the Philadelphia Museum of Art has found that people are attracted to costumes. So, of course, we have about 30,000 costume and textile objects that you know, they cover the world. So we do um, displays focusing on various aspects of these as well as, as major special exhibitions. But many departments in our museum also use pieces from the costume and textile collection in their exhibitions and installations um, as a way of providing something different, giving something we can relate to, people can easily relate to. Uh, so it's, it's more and more um, really co um, collaboration with other departments. Um, of course, we also overlap since many of the departments in the museum are uh, based in a certain um, uh, time like um, European painting or whatever, we overlap with them, so we're very always working with the South Asian uh, department and East Asian department and other departments as well. So I think um, people know having a, a costume is, is really a way to, to sort of activate a space, um, and we certainly try to keep things that are appealing to the public in mind when we set up our special exhibitions and uh, installations as well. Mm -hmm. And the short answer. Yes. <laughs> and one thing that, that you all did recently that I thought was an excellent way of engaging the public was the embroidery table that you came yes. up with. Yes. Well, that's another, exactly, we also try to have activities. So in the last uh, few exhibitions in the study gallery, for example, we've had something, either a drawing table where people could design their own um, clothes, and this was aimed specifically at children, but also for grown-ups too. Or right now we have an embroidery table in an exhibition I did on uh, shawls from the early 20th century, um, many of which have, are covered with embroidery. So the embroidery table is really very popular, amazingly popular. In fact, we have to keep changing the, the um, surface. And uh, the other day I went in and there, are two, there were two like 20-something guys sitting there embroidering. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been in there and asked, you know, what people and. Some people have never embroidered before, which has, you know, for people in textiles is hard to imagine, but um, it's, it's true. And we're planning something for the next exhibition, uh, which will be on African textiles. There'll be a, a pattern building activity with blocks. So that's, a, you know, people like to have something engaging to do. Um, and a, a, another thing that I'm sure other people will mention too is, is picking something that's got a little bit of a spark of relevance to today or linking back like the exhibition on the little white dress because the little white dress was kind of a popular thing and looking back historically. So something that you can tease out uh, or refer to something that people are familiar with. Yeah, and Colleen, you and I were speaking earlier about engaging children and how that's sort of a, a new idea. So how do you feel that FIT engages students, both little and big, um, and members of the public differently, or maybe not differently? 
I think the way that we present our exhibitions, for example, giving tours to groups, which we give many, many tours of each of our exhibitions, um, and also classroom tours that give a history of 20th century fashion. And personally, I tend to approach those groups in the same way, meaning if it's an FIT student group because these are college-age students, um, I put them on the same level as I would any other adult group that's coming from outside of FIT. Um, with children, I find that they prefer to make their own observations about objects and ask questions of me or get my feedback on the comments that they make. So it's a very different way of, of showing them through the space. Um, but I think as far as engaging FIT students versus an adult public, um, the biggest difference is that the FIT students are encouraged to have hands-on participation with certain objects. So we have a study collection of more than 1,000 pieces that the students are encouraged to use in various ways and is meant to be handled. Um, obviously, our permanent collection, which is about 50,000 pieces, is not to be handled in that way, but we do try to bring in students so they can look at construction and really engage with the physical objects. Yeah, and, and in that vein, I'm thinking about the brand archives and this idea of a collection as not only a public resource, but an internal resource, too. Do you want to speak to that a little bit, Suzanne? Uh, sure. There, there are a lot of motivations for um, a fashion company keeping an archive. Um, well, often it often just brings it back without even meaning to. It's just people throw things in the back closet. It's there, you know, for <laughs> centuries or well, centuries rather. Um, although actually, we do have some things from the late nineteenth century. Um, it's part of our archive. Um, and you know, there's certainly a lot of combing that you have to do through it to find the relevant material. But once you do, there's so many ways to use it. Um, first, you can like engage the employees that work for you, just kind of inspire them, give them actual like, fodder to look at when they're um, engaged in the design process. Um, sometimes it's used in even a legal capacity. Um, if you um, say that you're the first company to introduce X and X item, then you can actually, you need to prove that, and you can refer to those items. I mean, for example, Van Houston, they just, um, launched a, an innovative collar last fall, and so it was great to be able to go back to the archive and say, well, we were, you know, this was a major innovation almost 100 years ago as well, and we've always been at the forefront of that. So it's nice to be able to back that up. It sometimes that has a role in, um, in marketing that I think that a lot of consumers are starting to look towards companies that really kind of, maybe they're just not a flash in the pan anymore. It's not just a thing of the moment, but shows that they've actually had some integrity and this kind of historical importance for, for many years. I mean, um, you know, from Fry Boots and like another company saying that they had, they made um, Civil War boots for, you know, cavalry people or some of the brands have come back like a Filson or um, a Pendleton. I think we're seeing that um, a lot in industry. So it's, it's really nice to kind of be able to tap into the sort of rich history that, um, that they have. Um, yeah, in, yeah, it's really almost the tip of the iceberg of it, but there's, there, there are many ways to engage with the fashion collection. Um, I'm thinking now, Carolyn, your experience with an archive, but also with a museum. How do you feel that they differ? And actually, Susan, you can speak to this too, having been at the Costume Institute and at um, BBH now. How are they different? And what are the motivations? Mm -hmm. How are the motivations yeah, different? <laughs> Yeah, so I uh, was Nicole Miller's ARCHIV intern, but I was for Nicole Miller Philadelphia, which is owned by Mary Kay Doherty, who is, um, she's a licensee of the brand, and she has been really close friends with Nicole Miller for over 30 years. So um, for their 30th year anniversary, she really wanted an ARCHIV. I was the one and only ARCHIV intern she's ever had. So it's basically her closet from the last 30 plus years. Um, and so it's deeply personal to her, and uh, a lot of it are just different patterns that she's created, Philadelphia-related patterns and things like that, so it's very sentimental. So the intent of the collection is much different than a museum's collection. Um, often, you know, we, I, I needed her to tell me, you know, what are we trying to do here? Are we trying to tell the story of, you know, the, your, your, are we trying to tell your story versus are we trying to tell, like, you know, the craft of the clothing? 
So it's just it was very different. Um, and so yeah, she she really wanted to tell that friendship story because that's I think it was a really great marketing tool for her at the time. And it's just a fun it's just a fun take on costume archiving. Um, so what we did is kind of sat down and I interviewed her about each piece of clothing and the memories that she had around each piece, hoping to you know someday create some kind of interesting you know exhibition about that and then. We used it in her marketing for the season as well, um, where the campaign slogan was, you don't have to wear a suit to feel strong. Um, and that was about you know, the empowerment of women. So what I did is took pieces from the archive, old old 80s power suits with the shoulder pads and everything that Nicole did a little bit of, um, and those double-breasted uh, dresses and things that were you know, suit-inspired, um, and showed the history of that in the window and then showed where she came today. And, Nicole Miller has kind of said before that she's not a designer that likes to look at fashion history as much. She likes to kind of create something new, um, which, I mean, I think it's impossible almost to not include fashion <laughs> history in, in what you're designing today. But, I mean, she just, that's kind of what her aesthetic is. She tries not to, you know, directly draw inspiration from the past. So it's just been really interesting. It was really interesting to see, you know, that intent and how different that was because it was just completely personal. Mm -hmm. And it was telling her own story through her archive, which was really interesting. One thing that I keep hearing coming up is this idea of how important the exhibition is, and I, I don't think we can stress enough because that's really your opportunity to put the collection in front of the public. So my question is really to all of you, how can exhibitions, both big and small, uh, play a role in making historic costume and textile collections a public resource, and what role do they have? Um. I say well, um, well, one of the motivations of keeping a, a collection from an industry standpoint would be to be able to contribute items on loan for exhibitions. It's great to not to know that you actually have these items at your disposal. Um, to a greater extent, even I mean, I think it would be a dream of like any company to be able to stage um, something of a retrospective, mm -hmm. um, whether it's on their own premises or as part of an institution. And I certainly, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see even more of that in the future. There are a number of um, major anniversaries coming up, for example, Ralph Lauren is turning 50, Calvin Klein is the year after that. Um, you know, I'm the first person to also recognize that when these sort of exhibitions are staged, you know, the, the curators have a, a bit of a tricky job to do. You don't want the sort of um, backing from a fashion company to compromise the, the scholarly integrity of the show. But at the same time, I think it's, you often see like a pretty good symbiotic relationship that, you know, um, institutions that often need money and crowds and content, the company can kind of bring that. They get their publicity and prestige, and the public, I think, certainly really, they, they often really enjoy these shows. It's something that's a little bit more in their wheelhouse. Sometimes you don't have to be, have a rarefied interest in a certain item, but it's something that some brand names or even kind of aspirational luxury brands that people, I think, really do enjoy seeing, and I would be surprised if we see more of that. Yeah, that's a great point about that sort of brand name draw and how that operates. Do you want to contribute something to this? Sure, uh, this is Colleen. Um, I think that fashion <laughs> exhibitions are, are really fascinating to put together um, because so many people come to these shows with this sort of preconceived notion of what they're going to see or how they're going to relate to objects. And I think for me, the appeal of putting together these shows, other than of course I love fashion, is being able to contextualize these things or give a sense of what their significance is, whether that's historic or thematic. And so to really allow people to look beyond, this is ugly, this looks good, I would wear this, I wouldn't, <laughs> and think about why fashion or clothing in general is so important in so many different ways. Um, and the museum at FIT has a very strong collection and one of our galleries is entirely devoted to showing permanent collection objects. So, and it's also a historical gallery. So it goes usually back all the way to the 18th century. We switch out the theme every six months, so there's always something new to see. And so that really encourages people to come back to the museum, to keep learning about fashion if they're interested in clothing. 
Uh, and I think one of the side benefits of that is also that people are aware that we are collecting and that we have a permanent collection. And it's a great way to reach out to designers and say, we're doing this show and this piece would be perfect for it. Would you help us out and let us show it or donate it to our collection? So I think that there are, are so many fantastic opportunities with fashion exhibitions that are just kind of coming into their own. All right, so I've never, this is Jessica, I've never seen a fashion exhibition before. So like, what exactly does it look like? Does it look like a regular museum when you go to like a regular art gallery or like the Franklin Institute or something? Like how is it like set up and like displayed? That's in all of those ways. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very good question. And that it can be almost anything. There can be the wild and wacky, they're, you know, very classic, you know, very historically based. It can, you know, be just a, a whole environment. Uh, so, and I think that's the, this is Christina, by the way. Um, <laughs> but this is uh, something I, I wanted to to get up say anyway. So, thank you for asking the question. Is that there with exhibitions? Of course, people want to come to exhibitions, and museum mm -hmm. have exhibitions to attract people and see the objects firsthand. But there's also this blockbuster problem. Mm -hmm. uh, it's great to have people come and see these blockbuster shows. But that often just um, is one part of the collection or one little aspect. And uh, I know m most museums are now very concerned about also attracting people to see the permanent collection, as Colleen mm -hmm. was saying, because we have fabulous resources um, that uh, people, you know, you might walk by the galleries sometime on your way to, um, you know, the, the exhibition that you came to see. And, and so, Philadelphia Museum of Art, it, you know, you can spend an entire day there yeah. just in the permanent collection. Now, of course, the other thing to say is fashion and costume and textiles can't be out permanently, typically, <laughs> because of the problems with exposure to light. So we have to rotate things, pretty much. So there is um, an impetus to always have something new. It's also extremely uh, labor-intensive to mount something, mm -hmm. because you have to dress the mannequins, make the forms, do all of this kind of thing. Instead of just you know putting a painting on the wall, <laughs> not to diminish what my colleagues, but you know, really, they, you know, you and, and oftentimes you will find museums I know have come to us and wanted to borrow something, and when they find out like, oh, um, where do you buy the paper here? You're like, no, 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 you have to make the paper here. You know, where do you? They, there's just no understanding of what it takes to actually put it on. So, um, well, it is very popular and can be many many things. It's also it has to be recognized as something that that really does take um, a lot of uh, time, um, skill, and and money, uh, which is, is also a factor. This is Suzanne, I would just like jumping to say, yeah, the, yeah, those resources, I mean, sometimes that's just the thing that breaks my heart as somebody that's worked at a small historical society as well, and, and it's great that, you know, you can just like, be resourceful and do the best you can, but then when you step into another show, some of these blockbusters, it's all the bells and whistles. You just wonder, can these smaller institutions, you know, ever compete with that? I mean, I think the audience is very different, and they, they understand, you know, a degree of difference that you know, it's not going to be on a par, but I just hope that, you know, we're not, we don't become a society that's so distracted by flat screens mm -hmm. and moving parts and everything that we can't just, like, observe the objects for what they actually are. That's an excellent point, and actually it makes me wonder our collection is obviously an institutional collection, um, part of the university, and our hope is that it will be a teaching resource. So the question is, with you know a university collection or even a historic house collection, how can you make it more of an educational resource when you do have a limited budget? And that's open to all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think our collection here at Philadelphia University. It, wa it was a teaching collection for so many years, and that's how it was built. Um, and I think with, I've been thinking about this recently with the dawn of technology and the internet, and I think professors have kind of said, oh, well, I have like, this whole, I have access to all these materials online now. I don't need to use this physical example of a textile or a technique anymore in the classroom because I can just show a picture of it. And I think we've lost something there. Um, I know in my, in my dying and finishing class in school, um, <laughs> We were talking about uh, screen printing. It was pretty. It was kind of early on, and so people were confused about the process, how it works, like the layering and everything. 
And I think about a week later, we came across this example of screen printing in the collection. It has step by step, each, uh, each piece of fabric shows the layering process, shows how it matches up, and it would have been the perfect example to bring into that class. And I was just like, what a missed opportunity that was. You know, that that professor just didn't know anymore that that was accessible to them. And I think that was just such a shame. I went up to him afterwards and said, you know there's an example of this in the design center. And he's like, okay. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, he's, it's, it's, it's a shame that we kind of lost that a little bit. And I think, you know, now that, you know, if, within this institution, now that the, the um, resources are growing and that we're becoming more and more organized, that can happen again. And I would love to see that in more and more institutions, that hands-on, tactical example. Well, if I can jump in, maybe not hands on. Well, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. yeah. But but certainly, I mean, that I mean, we have our study pieces. Absolutely, too. but eyes, <laughs> you know, eyes on. Uh, but being able to see inside of things and see how things made, exactly. and that's made our study room where we can accept um, classes and groups and scholars and students who, by appointment, can come and we get objects out and we do the handling. But they can, you can turn something inside out. Mm -hmm. You can see how a seam is finished. You can look at things and. You know, people who haven't had the chance to have only seen, you know, images of things, it, it's a revelation um, to, to really see uh, what some of these things are. Evan Lane, as an historian, if, even from another point of view, when you're in the presence of the real thing, it has that feel that you can't possibly get. I'm uh, thinking of, for example, um, the pink outfit, uh, Kennedy's, you know, mm -hmm. hat, mm -hmm. the pink Jackie's mm -hmm. stuff. You could see that on the internet a picture, but if you're actually looking mm. at it, you get that sense of history, or something that was very uh, intricately embroidered with gold, or whatever. You can't you can't see that or feel it when you're looking at a picture. And, and I have to agree with what you said. There's nothing that replaces actually being in the presence of something. Otherwise, you lose the sense of history. Mm -hmm. yeah. with it. This is Suzanne. I remember my mom seeing um, like his top hat. And oh, in the collection, yeah. she started to weep. <laughs> She's a tender heart, but I don't think <laughs> <laughs> so. You know, there there is a certain aura about the actual object, and and if you are a student too, just seeing the actual craft, the stitches, the technique, you can, it's, it's hard to replace that. But I like the oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, Stan Gors. Okay, <laughs> Stan Gorski, uh, Director of Special Collections here at the University. Um, I agree with everything that's been said, but I, I, I want to throw a small caveat, and that is, is I think, especially with smaller institutions, there's sometimes this impulse to hoard materials, and I don't think it's appropriate. I think there has to be a degree of responsibility if you can't properly take care of the material that's donated to you, whether you have an oil painting that tends to be worth, I mean, by a major artist that just happened to be donated to you 50 years ago, you have costume collection, you have rare books, you have uh, ceramics, you have a Picasso ceramic or something. If you can't take it and, and take care of it properly, mm -hmm. I don't think you have, you should have enough responsibility to say that maybe this should be, you know, Donated, sold. I don't know how. However, but you shouldn't be, you know, put it away in a closet and say, "Well, it's ours and we have it." <laughs> I, mean, I don't think that's fair, and I don't think it's responsible as a professional in the in, in the field. Uh, my name is Beth Evans. I'm an instructor here, but I've also worked um, with the Germantown Historical Society's costume collection. And I, when I worked there, I worked over a period of time that you could see. For a long time, it was a repository of, well, what do we do with grandma's stuff? We'll give it to the historical <laughs> society. Two, places becoming much more responsible and saying, that's absolutely wonderful, but we cannot accept this okay. unless you're going to help us <clears throat> take care of it, get it in position, and do things like that. Right. And I think that more and more places have been aware of that, but there's a transitional place for a small museum like that that doesn't have the resources. I think, uh, Stan Gorski again, uh, when an institution, say Germantown Historical, uh, some, a smaller institution, or even one that, I mean, like we, uh, I'll, I'll talk from experience, not in textiles, but we were offered one time, not lately, many years ago, a rare book collection dealing with children's literature. Why would we accept that? Even though it had a high monetary value, there is no reason in 
I mean, there's no reason for us to take that. I mean, what would we do? Show it? I mean, we could make an exhibit, but we have no education school. We have no, I mean, we'd just be able to say that we own this. I mean, there's other institutions in this area, uh, academic institutions, that have, that could use, uh, utilize that material. And we refused it. And I think that's what, what should be done. Now, you're saying if, if a donor is giving whatever that article is and willing to pay for uh, the upkeep and maintenance and conservation, well, okay, that, that, well, that makes sense. But if it fits I, your if I mean, mission, if it I your mission if, right. If this is Christine, it speaks to the importance of a collect of a mission, you know, right. having a collecting policy and sticking to it and not just um, taking things so that you end up with a bunch of stuff no, that you I'm, can't, can't, don't, mm -hmm. you know, that is not interesting and that you can't deal with. Um, so that's number one for most museums is to have, you know, keep track of your things and have a collecting policy. And it's it's very, and especially I have to say, as a dealing with clothes, people offer, uh, we take, you know, less than 5% of what's offered right. to us mm -hmm. as a gift. And, and um, people, it's tricky because people are very attached to their clothes. Clothes are very personal. Mm -hmm. They like, you know, it was their favorite dress or, you know, or something, and it really, it was their grandmothers, and as we were saying, it has this aura about it. Now, many people recognize it's very hard to care for these things when they've been up in the attic or down in a wet basement or something. So we, we do get offered them, but you know they, they do require care. But but it's very hard to say no to something. Um, I mean, you have to learn how to do it. We have similar examples, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But because clothes are so personal, and, and especially clothing, so that, that adds to the, to the issue. Yeah. And this is actually a great segue to my next question, which is how do you decide which pieces should be in the collection or in an exhibition, and is the public considered in these types of decisions? Colleen, do you want to take that sure. first? Sure. Okay. Um, well, as Christina mentioned, mission is our, our number one priority. We always go back to that. Um, but because we have content that really covers the mid-18th century to the present, um, we have some pretty big and pretty great holdings. Surprisingly, we still have a lot of gaps. So, for example, for some strange reason, we don't have much from the 1860s. <laughs> so, as we're putting together these fashion history shows, and we're really trying to span all this time, there are certain eras that we're always kind of looking out for, whether they're at auction, occasionally donation, although now people are much more aware of the value of fashion, so the older pieces are rarer as donation, and of course, condition's a factor. Um, for me, as far as exhibitions go, I tend to be a pretty minimalist curator. I don't like to have a lot of objects just for the sake of having a lot of objects. Um, particularly because I think part of the appeal of fashion objects is that you can see them hopefully in the round or they have this 3D quality to them. And once you start to get too many pieces, in, in our case, a relatively small gallery, it loses some of that three-dimensional appeal. Um, so for me, the selection process for exhibitions is does this piece tell its own very distinct story? Obviously, it has to tie back to the thesis of the show, but does it stand alone? Is it overlapping too much with another object? Am I going to include three of these just because they all look great if they're all saying the same thing? Um, and we have an outside collections committee that uh, we always refer to when we're bringing in new acquisitions and if we're deaccessioning anything so that you know, not one person can become obsessed with Lisa Miyake one year in accession to do seven things for no reason. <laughs> um, so we do have a little bit of, uh, of guidance with that, um, but it's not truly outside. We, of course, know exactly who this group is, and they're usually people who are very knowledgeable about fashion and museums. I was going to say, there are definitely challenges um, from an industry point of view because we're, we're not benefited by hindsight of knowing what's important about what we're producing now. I mean, one thing is you can't save every garment produced by every brand. I mean, it's, it's absurd, and, and most of it is going to be of little consequence. So the best we can do for now is to think of some criteria, um, say it's something that is a bestseller or you know a staple of the brand that it's known for. 
um, perhaps of something um, that was innovative in some way, um, something that was associated with a famous advertising campaign or worn by a celebrity. And so just kind of offering guidelines about what to keep. I mean, sometimes it's guesswork. I mean, maybe we'll go back to these things in 20 years and say, no, that, that didn't really prove itself in a way. And maybe that's when we, we revisit NDAC. But, um, but it's different because it's, it's automatic. We're not calling from a large pool of things, but a very specific mm -hmm. output of brands. But that said, um, that people did put things aside and things that we do have a little bit more historical um, appreciation for. I mean, we're just finding wonderful things all the time. I mean, Warner's um, is one of our brands of ladies intimates, and they started as um, a corsetry company in Connecticut. And that was one of those instances thrown in the basement for a while, moved to a few locations, and now we're finding um, you know, Dr. Warner's lectures about, you know, women's health and seeing almost like an evolution of like women's like sartorial emancipation through the years just <laughs> through this one very specific lens. So I think, I, I would like to think that some of these things, you know, will, you know, will eventually start to tell these narratives, but some things are just so recent. It's just kind of, it's guesswork right now. I mean, some of it just looks like stuff that came out of my drawer right now. And I'm like, it's not that special, but, but, but maybe someday it will be. Yeah. That sounds like a great exhibition. <laughs> um, oh, sure. Hi. Uh, it, this is Federica Laca from Politecnico di Milano, and I'm a visiting professor here in Fila U just for this semester, and uh, I cover all the uh, heritage and craft uh, topics. Uh, I think that one of the points that uh, that is very interesting for me is the use of archive as uh, Suzanne, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, Suzanne said before also to engage and prove uh, the importance of a company. What uh, uh, in Italy is really a strong element is a kind of iconization of some product that coming from the brand that uh, are placed into the retail space to emphasize uh, and make uh, this kind of knowledge that is behind the brand itself uh, mm -hmm. very strong uh, and also to engage the final consumer. Uh, for example, Ferragamo or uh, mm -hmm. the Gucci Museum that have a very uh, close connection with the commercial side uh, of the new brand's uh, items. And uh, I'd like to know your position on this field because uh, it's uh, an in-between from uh, a real museum and the collection approach uh, and something that is more connected to the consumption and from the brands so. Yeah, Suzanne, I mean, yeah, I think it's wonderful that they're doing that. Um, and it's, it was a funny interest, I read a piece about Bali, for example, and even though they're um, situated in rural um, Switzerland, even they have an offsite, and we're trying to tell <laughs> like our designers that like your inspirational materials, sometimes you just can't even have it on the premises. So if you're gonna um, have a repository of your history, you know, you have to make a real strategy about how you're gonna preserve that because you also want the people that work for your company not to think of it as this like glorified fashion closet that's just like a free for all, <laughs> but you actually really want to instill that respect. If anything, um, that's one thing I'm trying to take from my museum background and put it into um, the company where I work now is that maybe it doesn't always look like flashy to them all the time, but to have the sort of like, you know, clean hands treatment, table coverings, it's not like a conference table, it's not like all the, you know, kind of trappings of high fashion, but just to kind of take it back a little bit, I hope that even just besides those being best practices, I hope that instills more respect for these actual items so they're not going to be like swatching from them or losing them. <laughs> and when that happens, well, actually, the, I will say, you know, it was a, just last week, um, I had a designer from Calvin Klein and his entourage came to check out um, our newly installed offsite archives. And you know what? There wasn't anything I could do. I just wasn't used to it, but um, a model was brought along to um, <laughs> try it out. But that's the thing. That's, that's one of those learning curves that's different coming from Museum World to industry is that they're doing this for a reason. Um, it's they're not embalming these items and you know just hoping that they'll be useful someday, but they're actually being used in the design process, and that's why they're you know they're putting the resources into it is to actually use it. So, Carolyn, when you did the retrospective at Nicole Miller, that was actually historic pieces that were in the windows mm -hmm. of Nicole Miller. So that sounds kind of like what Federica is talking about: this idea of using the historical piece 
in the same space as the commercial piece. Do you want to talk a little bit about what your motivations were when you put that together? Sure. I mean, I think that, the, like you said before, the intent with that collection was quite different. Um, we had interns wearing the clothes from the collection to parties and things, so it just was very different, and, um, you know, that level of, you know, historical respect wasn't really there. Um, so we could do something really fun and really approachable like that display. Um, and I think, you know, you mentioned the Ferragamo Museum. Um, and, and the Gucci Museum, I think that they've done an incredible job to, you know, represent their brand and even their current brand in those exhibits, and while still keeping that air of mystery and not showing everyone everything and, you know, bringing in different inspirations, and I think that that's been, like, ingenious for their brand. Um, you know, it's very, that, like, still fairy, fairy tale like desirability of these big designer brands. And it's like a wonderful way for them to, to use their heritage to promote their current brand. And that's really what a lot of brands are doing. That's what Nicole Miller is trying to do in essence. Um, and yeah, that's just, and it's genius. I mean, we all love to look back at history to see, you know, where we've come and where, where, where we're going, maybe. But I think visitors, and this is Christina, would recognize if they're going to the Ferragamo Museum, you know that you are going to get the Ferragamo story as mm -hmm. told by Ferragamo. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas, you're not, you know, if you if you did approach the same subject in another place that wasn't obviously brand based, it would be a different story. So, I think already just knowing what the purpose, you know, understanding there's an innate understanding that that is going to promote their brand, as opposed to having an exhibition in a museum where it might be on Ferragamo, but you would at least, you know, try to put it in the context of what else was happening. The brand is not necessarily concerned with telling the story of all the other people who might have been, you know, you know doing <laughs> other things that they want to focus on their brand. And, and one reason that there are these archives and there's more impetus is, is designers and, and companies have realized that this is really good for marketing and it is important. They don't just get rid of all the things, you know, um, that typically when this designers start out, they're not, you know, they're just living paycheck to paycheck and trying to make it and not concerned about saving things. But that even for young designers is changing now because of the emphasis on, on history and and branding and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, and Suzanne, this, um, one additional challenge I've become aware of is how um, when a designer leaves a house, there's sometimes this ambiguous area where you don't know if that designer can can keep those items or it belongs to the house. I know there have been a number of like legal matters um, and sometimes, I mean, you know, it seems like there's a lot more revolving doors lately with um, shorter term associations with a given designer and a brand to end. So, you know, I know people are pursuing like things that they design for X next company, but they have to do it on their own terms, get it off of eBay or something. So it's, it's interesting to think about how the business um, kind of shapes like you know, what, what is being collected, who owns what, it's, it's confusing. <laughs> that is really interesting, you know, this idea of who owns what and how it's being collected. Um, one thing that I've been avoiding a little bit, but I know we have to talk about, is this idea of the online space in an effort to make collections a public resource. Um, so maybe in particular for the PMA and for FIT, how is that online space becoming an opportunity for public engagement? Well, I, this is Christina. I think it's increasingly important to have a very strong online presence because that is the way that people find out, one, what you have and learn about something. So certainly at the museum, we're very concerned with the online presentation. And in fact, there's I'm on a committee that's, that's discussing that and has been for months now um, as, as how to really activate the collection online for people who can't come to the museum or is it preliminary for people just to, to know what we have. Um, it's already been mentioned that seeing something online is not the same as seeing it in person and of course we all recognize that but seeing something online or having information about it is certainly better than not knowing it about it. So uh, as the museum moves forward, they're certainly um, trying to have more curated experiences online so you can, you know, really see things. But of course, again, with costume, there's a particular problem that we don't have good photographs of many, many things because mm -hmm. it is so hard to dress something unless it's out for an exhibition or something. You, you know, it, take, it can take you half a day to get something dressed and get a photograph. So it's incredibly labor intensive and expensive. Um, you know, some some uh, accessories are easier to photograph, but even then, we're very limited 
for what we can have online. So that's really something that's that we're um, discussing and debating. And it's also very important, I'll just say, finally, to have an online presence because some things cannot be out um, permanently. Grace Kelly's wedding dress is an example. <laughs> you know, there's great interest in this, and people want to know about it, but we cannot have it out all the time. Certainly, we can only have it out maybe every 10 years or something for a very short period. So we're exploring options for ways that we can have it represented both in the museum, but also um, online, and, and, have, and of course there's you know, books as well, but the online is the, the way to go. Oh, this is Jessica. I'm just curious, because like, I know you stated that you can't keep clothes out long because of the lighting and everything of that nature. How exactly do you preserve the clothes? Like, if they're not up in display? They're, well, it, it varies a little bit uh, due to different elements, but typically they're kept under climate control conditions, so that's temperature and humidity are kept constant at certain things, so they don't get mildewy or anything like that in the dark, so they're not faded from the light, and all the materials that are next to them are acid-free or not, so they won't further uh, corrode things. Now, there's a certain process that's inevitable anyway that mm -hmm. many materials are going to be a fr you know, fragile and over time will, will um, self-destruct, but we try to retard that as much as possible and limit the light exposure and certainly that's the importance of mannequins and, and proper mounting so that you're not stressing something. Um, and in fact, many of the older garments are actually stronger than some of the newer <laughs> garments that have had things, uh, you know, added or People don't think of, you know, when you make clothes, you don't necessarily think, how am I going to preserve this for 100 years? The plastic you make that out of is going to fall apart. And, <laughs> you know, that's the nature of the of the beast. Okay. Jane, uh, like it's, I, what, what Christine is saying is really important for our collection because we don't, when you photograph something, you want it photographed well because the competition is... Uh, if somebody goes online and finds a dress of ours next to a, the same dress at the Met, and our dress looks like a rag, and the one at the Met <laughs> looks like it was, oh, no, 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 it's not that it is a rag, it looks like a rag, because somebody took a picture with their camera in, in a room that didn't have proper lighting, and the dress wasn't tarted up, and so you put that and we'll say, oh, well, um, we're not going to go to Philadelphia University for that dress. We're going to go to the Met because they've got a gorgeous example. Ours may be much better, a much better color. It could be in a lot of things. But when you're showing something online, it has to be good to compete with something else. So it can't be amateurish. You need good photographers. That's a lot of money. You need, you know, you need to have things that are archivally strong. So it's very important that we don't get volunteers to come in and shoot away pictures. Oh, oh, we've got pictures of that. We had, years ago, we had someone who wanted to use examples from the collection in a book that they were making um, about fashion, and they were using historical examples in it. I just went berserk because I said, you cannot put that in a book because it it looks like somebody dragged it out. Nobody will get it. <laughs> Nobody will get it. So it's very important that we think about how we look in the world of... And if I could just yeah, add, also okay. add that there is a great pressure to get everything online. Oh, yes. And so... I have, you know, we are we have record photographs of lots of our objects that are record photographs. You can sort of see what color and shape it is, and many of the, not all of them, but but you know, a lot of them are online, even though they are not the photograph I would want to represent this object because we're not going to get another Chance. photograph. Now, some of them, you know, were were taken purely as record shots, so you have the storage mounts with the bonnet that's supposed to sit back here on the head, sitting up here on the head. I, you know, you have to draw the line somewhere for what you put online. <laughs> but it's, it's really difficult because it's so hard to get good images. And, and there is a lot, of, you know, people want every, all the collection online is really the goal. And the, and the, uh, the point of, of getting a good image is very hard on the garment. Every time you take a garment off, out of its box, open it up, handle it, put it up on that dress form, fuss around with it, fluff it out, do all this. Every time you touch a textile, you're adding years of waste and years of, 
of, of decay to it. So it's it's this constant balance of, of how do we do that, you know? So it's, and we don't have, you know, we're not, we can have Anna Wintour <laughs> well, uh, walking in with, ooh, <laughs> it's all relative, you know? I think that's one of the big problems, with, this is Beth Anna again, um, with a lot of the smaller collections, is how do you get the powers that be to respect your collection and its purpose enough to fund some of the things you want to do? Um, and I'm sure that's an issue for every museum, everyone. not just the smallest, but especially the small museums that um, and you know, are going to benefit from getting that stuff out there. Their whole institution will benefit, but how do you get those people to understand that? Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> I just had a quick question. Um, my name is Tiana. I'm a fashion student here at Philadelphia University. Um, just speaking on like um, photographs and where you can't take it, pictures of where you can't. I know that sometimes when I go to museums and see the costume exhibits, um, they're really like iffy about not taking pictures and putting it on social media. But there, there are some exhibits that you can. So, for instance, the Patrick Kelly exhibit that was at this one, I've noticed you could take pictures mm -hmm. of that one. But then it was like a really long time ago. I couldn't take pictures of like the Roberto Capucci one. So I wanted to know like what, how do you decide which pictures you can put on social media and then ones you can't. Does it depend on how old, how old it is? Or mm -hmm. Well, okay. no, you, typically it's a question of rights. So if you have lenders to an exhibition who don't want their piece photographed, you have to respect that. So the Patrick Kelly, that was fine. Everybody could photograph that. that. But other exhibitions, um, you know, there may be much more limited photography. If either a lender of a particular piece doesn't want the photographs taken, then they may ban photographs altogether. Or, you know, the, the um, entity who's lending most of the things doesn't want the photographs taken. So, but of course, it's becoming increasingly difficult to enforce because everybody has a camera with them now, um, and everybody wants to record what they see. So, um, I think that's something that that is changing. And you know, even rights of uh, since we're talking about online images, you know, it used to be that every museum and every place was trying to not have anybody copy their images or do anything. And increasingly, museums are finding that if they open that up and let people use their images is actually a, a benefit and they get people interested in the collection. So that's changing too. It's a very current question. Mm -hmm. it's, you you yeah. asked a really good question because we heard a whole symposium which was a big topic on this whole idea of photographing and not photographing. So you're right on the fashion <laughs> button. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. We can take one last question. Mm -hmm. I'm Rachel Stack. I'm a graduate assistant that works at um, the Design Center here at Philadelphia University. And my question was kind of, I was thinking about this when Stan was talking about like not acquisitioning certain things that like your collection can't take care of. And I actually, right under, right out of my undergrad, I worked at um, the Textile Conservation Workshop in the state of New York. And I saw this pattern of, you know, clients coming in small museums, even larger museums that were coming in for like conservation um, consulting and having the conservators basically tell them that it wasn't worth conserving either the costume or the textile because the actual value of the textile was like far less than what the conservation would, you know, cost. And I guess my thought about that is like, you know, in painting, I feel like in other conservation where I've seen it happen where general conservation normally adds to the value of other objects. And I'm kind of like wondering, kind of going forward and seeing this trend of like fiber and craft really like making a comeback in like contemporary art, if that would maybe like change the way we start to like conserve and take care of these collections. Or if that's even like a relevant, I don't know, I'm just like curious about what your mm -hmm. thoughts are about that. This is Colleen. I, I mean, I think to me it really depends on the value of the object to your collection, not just monetary, you know, in general. Um, and your this is a very personal opinion, but your question brought to mind uh, a quilt that my grandmother made that's absolutely gorgeous and in horrible disrepair. Um, my grandmother died when I was a tiny baby. I did not know her and I will spend money getting this quilt conserved because it's important to me. 
Um, and I feel like depending on maybe who the donor was or how this object relates to other pieces in the collection, it may have value to an institution or to an individual that says more than its monetary value. Um, that said, as we've said, a lot of collections don't have money, so it's really a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but I would hope, and this is something I've found um, working on a lot of shows that include contemporary fashion, I think there is much more awareness of the importance of archives and also of how to care for things. So more than just I'm a designer and I'm keeping things because it might be important, they're also being a little bit more cautious about how they're keeping things. And uh, I just, I won't name names, but I've been trying to get this particular company to participate in our exhibitions for a couple of years and they kept turning us down and I couldn't figure out why. And then I just opened a new exhibition and I asked them again <laughs> for some very important pieces. And they came through, but I realized they don't have an archive. What they had from this 50 piece collection was two things. Oh. So I was like, oh, so you're not just rejecting me, <laughs> you don't have anything. <laughs> but it was kind of funny because it's a contemporary label, it's a young designer, and it seems like that's so rare now that if you're asking for something from the past five years that people don't have it. So it was kind of a, an interesting thing. So I think that um, our perception of the importance of, of textiles in general is changing a little bit. I love that. And I think on that note, we will wrap it up. So thank you again to our panelists. Thank you to all of you for coming. I'm so grateful. And that's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs>